Start recording. Okay, everybody, it's very cozy in here, so you can <laughs> sit closer. And today we are very, very happy to have Dr. Jamie Shishel um, from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, from all the way from the U.S. <laughs> and um, her topic is very, very important for all of us. Uh, how can translanguaging resist and dismantle colonialism in testing and schools. You know that for, um, for our field, translanguaging has been a very powerful movement. But still, there is this, this very important frontier that we haven't been able to uh, come to terms with, is assessment and testing. And without um, developing valid and viable and useful approaches, translanguaging approaches to testing and assessment, it won't take root. And at the end of the day, the teachers are going to ask us, when you have testing which is monolingual, how do you persuade teachers to uh, have translanguaging approaches to pedagogy, right? Mm -hmm. So without further ado, let's put our hands together to welcome Dr. Jamie Shishao. <laughs> Thank you, Angel. Thanks, everyone. I'll See if this can be interactive at all too, but I don't. We'll we'll see how we how we work together. Um, before I talk about the topic, I just want to um, thank Dr. Angel Lin for the invitation and including me here today. Um, Quincy Wang made a very wonderful poster to help advertise the talk, and all of you at Simon Fraser University Faculty of Education and coming from other areas as well. Really appreciate that you came today. Um, so very common in Canada, actually not very common in the United States, is doing a land acknowledgement to start a talk. Um, I am drawing from um, the Simon Fraser Public Interest Research Group, a student group, and the land acknowledgement that they have um, put together. Um, and so their uh, land acknowledgement um, states that SFU occupies unceded indigenous lands belonging to the coast Salish peoples. Unceded means this land was never surrendered, relinquished, or handed over in any way. So we, the student group, and we today recognize that the unceded land that we occupy includes not only the SFU Burnaby campus, but extends to the lands occupied by the Vancouver and Surrey campuses of SFU as well. So these territories include the following First Nations, and I'm actually just focused, I just have the ones from Burnaby. So the Masaquim, the Sokomish, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Kweek, Um In talking about this, um, the land acknowledgement, I also want to acknowledge that um, we're doing this because settlers have forcibly removed, displaced, murdered, and had diseases and actions that have um, cause um, harm to indigenous peoples um, in order to remind us that colonization is an ongoing process, but also at the same time open up our space today with reverence and respect. Um, in doing all of this, I want to also talk about the um, kind of the performance and the irony of me as a descendant of settler colonials, uh, colonists doing a land acknowledgement. So there's a, um, there is a little bit of tensions around doing land acknowledgements versus actually just doing the reconciliation work to give land back, right? Um, and I think that's important for me to recognize my family, my great grandfather father actually like is when he was alive, so he passed away um, 10 years ago, but was very proud that we were the descent, the first settlers of Iowa, right? And my hometown, actually the hashtag for my hometown is where Iowa started, the state of Iowa. Right, so like it's very embedded in these colonial views of, of place. Um, and so in understanding what this land acknowledgement means is just kind of also a little bit of humor here um, from the Walking, Walking Eagle News is that um, it's important to do it for, for those very important indigenous reasons, but also understanding that in doing so um, without reconciliation, there is this tension that, that remains. And so just to kind of continue some of my positionality and why I'm talking about what I'm talking about today. Um, so as you notice, I have a very strong command of standard American English. Um, I grew up with some different dialects of English, but mostly standard American English um, is what I communicate in. I'm a white cisgendered woman, so I have a lot of privilege that comes with that. 
Um, I, throughout my life, have had access to resourced education systems. Um, I'm also a first-generation-ish college graduate. Um, my mother went back to school when I was growing up and graduated when I was 10. Um, but nobody else in my immediate family went to college and actually there's a lot of, there was a lot of tension around my mom going to college um, because that actually didn't necessarily afford her a career path that a lot of people would typically associate with getting a college degree. Um, um, as part of that, that meant that we grew up on public assistance. So my childhood was um, kind of shaped by that as well. Um, and I also grew up in a hometown that's known for extreme whiteness and um, active movements of white supremacy. And so this is something that's been part of my life, me understanding the role of white supremacy um, in uh, different communities. And so that's, this is my, that's my mom and my grandma. Um, so I think all of that kind of comes together to shape what I do in terms of being, I think I'm very energetic, like I'm quite passionate, um, educational linguist. I work collaboratively and really working to upend depression, right? Um, and the, um, the largely I focus on language minoritized groups in, in terms of the focus of how I'm working within oppressive structures. So in defining language minoritized, it's an adjective that highlights the delegitimization of linguistic practices. So that can be within named varieties and also outside of named varieties of languages. And it intersects with other racial, gendered, ableist, social, political, historical, economic, and ideological factors. And it's important to know that this delegitimization is usually done by people to people. Um, it also deals with the erasure, the displacement, and the um, destruction of indigeneity. Um, whether that is through um, trying to see who qualifies through DNA of blood quantum tests, um, the indigenous Latinx movement, um, in indigeneity and mestizo in um, Latin American countries, Afro-indigeneity, and then there's also a lot of work of what's happened in Vancouver as well. Um, when we look at testing, language minoritized um, falls under a very um, kind of more reductionistic definition, right? And it also um, is emblematic of some of the issues with testing is that it's a deficiency lens, right? So not yet proficient in English is generally um, who I'm talking about in terms of language minoritized um, individuals. Okay. So I know the talk is a lot about translanguaging, but actually it's it's gonna take us a little bit before we get to translanguaging, so I'll walk you through what the journey is gonna look like. So the first is talking about equity and or oppression and the ways that um, the exact same action can maybe be framed from both lenses. Um, talking about coloniality or de decolonization, genealogical approaches to kind of help understand this um, historical situatedness of the work. Um, and then some things directly from testing, looking at youth use oriented testing and the social consequences of testing. Um, then we'll move into um, the, uh, work on talking about how to be in good relation. Um, then translanguaging is anti-oppressive. Um, research methodologies that kind of lend itself towards doing this work, so participatory action research and hanging out critical ethnography. And that will bring us to translanguaging and assessment and some essential shifts that have been occurring. So the beginning part of the talk really focuses on critiques. And the second part of the talk really talks about concrete actions that can and have been taken. Okay. So in terms of conflicting perspectives with respect to testing, um, there are very dominant discourses talking about equity in assessment as being promoting high standards, providing evidence, documenting learning, um, objectivity, the importance of objectivity, a pathway within meritocracy, right? Um, and those exact same actions can also be framed um, as acts of oppression. So as gatekeeping, restricting, um, fear or anxiety producing, um, reinscribing hierarchies, objectivity in name only, right? Um, in inaccurate depictions or reflections of realities of test takers. And I like to connect all of this with um, a colonial framework. Um, and just to say the definitions that I'm drawing from within coloniality is 
talking about settler colonialism, so I focus mostly on work in the Americas. Um, so this is the, the permanent replacement of indigenous communities by settlers. Um, and just because there is sometimes dis, um, confusion between what is a settler and what is an immigrant, um, settlers are not immigrants, right? They, are the, they come in, they create the new laws of the land. And so um, immigrants are beholden to the laws that are already existing and settlers are coming in and kind of dominating and replacing. Um, within testing, these become recirculated in terms of um, ide upholding ideologies of inequity, social, in social efficiency, and neoliberalism, which are all connected with colonial, settler colonialism. Um, and schools and evaluation have really played an active role in the destruction of indigenous people. And um, when using this um, decolonial lens, I think I want to also not overstate what, what it means as well. Um, and so there's been quite a bit of work, um, and I like this Tuck and Wang article where they don't want decolonization to just be a metaphor, right? Decolonizing your mind, decolonizing methodologies, decolonizing education, right? And really doing this type of work with a very explicit lens of trying to understand the relationship with social justice, with indi indigenous issues, when indigenous issues are only when indigenous issues actually do actually affect other people as well. Um, and you'll see in some of the applications of this why I use a decolonial lens within testing, because um, I do think that the erasure of indigenous peoples is one of the, is a large problem that isn't, hasn't been addressed, especially in testing. Um, Within testing, um, there is a perspective that really helps to foreground the experiences of test takers, and that's use-oriented testing. So rather than focusing on the test itself and the development of the instruments, it's focusing on what happens to the person who takes the test um, and the long and short-term consequences, not only on the person, but on um, education as a whole, societies as a whole. Um, so this really, looks at the effects, the uses, the consequences of testing rather than looking at um, how to refine and perfect um, the measurement. And in looking at those consequences, um, it's important not to just look at one consequence in isolation, but to really um, put it within a historical view. So the genealogical approach really helps um, afford that type of perspective. So it, Genealogical approaches destabilize established categories. Um, and rather than focusing on linear progression, they really um, focus on a present moment and connecting it um, to the different histories and pasts that have made it possible. So what that means in genealogical approaches is that um, a lot of things that we take for granted, um, as e even things that we think are problematic, like I would say, like. Most people understand that there's quite a bit of problems associated with testing, um, is understanding that they're actually even more problematic or more dangerous than they even appear. Um, so you'll see, I'll have some memes and tweets in here, um, but just this idea that we need to understand history from these other perspectives rather than from just the dominant perspective that's led us to the situations of inequity and oppression that are still current today. So in looking at the social consequences of testing, um, the first thing is just to clarify testing. So if, if you were to be a person who researched testing, you would care a lot about the distinctions between testing, assessment, and evaluation. Um, if you are a test taker, generally those delineations between categories are completely irrelevant to your lived experiences. So if a teacher tells you, oh no, that was an assessment, not a, not a standardized test, you're, but you're still struggling or you still are facing consequences, that, that distinction doesn't matter as much. Um, but in talking to people in the assessment world, it's really important to make this clarification about um, foregrounding the test taker's perspective. Um, and then in consequences as well, um, it has been a big focus within assessment also to um, distinguish between intended and unintended consequences of test use um, and test misuse as well. And that is largely to make sure that you 
you can distance people involved in testing from the consequences of testing, right? So if it's an unintended negative consequence, then who is responsible for it, right? And, the, um, and again, if we're taking this use-oriented perspective where we're foregrounding the test taker's experience, that also is irrelevant because that consequence still happens. Um, and if you think about any other just like normal aspect of your life, um, you're responsible for the consequences of your actions, whether or not you wanted, the, you intended for those consequences. Um, so kind of taking that and moving that into the testing world as well. And then this is a kind of famous cartoon that you might know, just kind of critiquing testing, not being tailored to the specific needs of individuals. Um, and I think it's important because if we think about this, this analogy, but if we think about really like what testing has done historically um, in our understanding of education, it is difficult to imagine a situation where no action would be taken if a new assessment system were to result in white children being outperformed by their peers in every minority group. Right. Um, and so in understanding how and why we got to this situation, um, we can look over 100 years of social consequences of testing and see that the oppression continues, right? Um, language minoritized bilinguals have faced repeated, often severe consequences that exacerbate existing and introduce new, new ones. And so what I've done in, as so I wrote a book that was published in March, and in it, it goes over, it centers the language minoritized bilingual experience and different reason, things that they're just seeking in their life and all the tests and policies, court cases, and other um, uh, mechanisms that have served um, in kind of restricting their access to these things that they're seeking. So whether they're seeking entry to the USA, seeking some type of civic participation, whether that's voting rights um, or participating in the military, seeking higher ed or seeking K through 12 education. And I'm gonna give you one example um, that comes out of this little spot right there with content tests, um, test accommodations. Um, but test accommodations also connect now with uh, the ACT with a college entrance exam now allows test accommodations for emergent bilinguals or for language minoritized um, bilinguals. And it also connects with histories of intelligence testing and military testing as well. Um, so that's why when creating some type of graphic to show how complicated things are and trying to make it like it's supposed to look complicated, but it's even more complicated than the, the tiny bit of sense making that I have here. This is just mostly the organization of chapters, like what I had to do to make it make some sense. Um, so looking at test accommodations, we're all good? Yeah. Okay. Um, so test accommodations, the definition is that they aim to reduce construct irrelevant variance due to English proficiency for language minoritized students taking content exams. Um, and for example, that would mean that on a math test, a bilingual student would be able to demonstrate their knowledge of a math operation rather than their ability to parse the, question, the, the linguistic aspects of the question. So that the language, trying to really do a strict separation of content knowledge and language knowledge. Um, in practicality, what they end up looking like are changes to the test administration, um, extended time read aloud in small group. Those are the most common test accommodations given to um, students in schools. Um, testing response, so sometimes you can have students do a scribe or a, a oral recording. Or the test itself and you can have translated and bilingual versions. Um, Currently, they are the most predominant practice of inclusion of language minoritized students that are classified as English learners in the United States and in other regions of the world. So it is common in Canada. I don't know if you're familiar with the practice here, but very similar policies to what we have in the United States. Um, it's also common um, in non-English, non-Anglophone countries. So in Europe, they're using this as well. Um, for um, usually for um, students that have recently immigrated. The metaphor for test accommodations is usually that they're a, a tool to level that levels the playing field, um, making everything equal, right? But um, I argue that that also levels the complexities and controversies around test accommodations, which I'll get to at the end of this little section. 
Okay. So in taking a genealogical lens to test accommodations, it's important to know that test accommodations have been used since the very beginning of modern intelligence testing. So when the first intelligence tests were developed and used in the United States, um, test accommodations, they weren't called that at the time, but test accommodations were also developed and used. And these are s very similar to the ones we use today. So the first ones were used um, for interpreting of intelligence tests at Ellis Island in, in 1913, and that was by Henry Goddard. Um, Henry Goddard at the time was a very well-known eugenicist as well, so he was working to um, demonstrate and illustrate um, how he could use intelligence tests to talk about different racial hierarchies um, and to use that for restrictive immigration policies. And as a eugenicist, also selective, um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, forced sterilization and things like that. Um, also, a little bit more controversial to talk about is the the use of the there was army. The largest first use of intelligence tests in the United States was the Army um, Alpha and the Army Beta and the Army Performance Tests. So those used on 1.7 million people for World War One um, to determine if they would be eligible for working in officer status or different. Um, deployment battalions. Um, Lewis Terman, who is a very well-known um, psychologist and was a professor at Stanford University throughout his career at that time, was also um, um, closely affiliated with the eugenicist movement, as were many people that were, almost everyone that was working in intelligence testing at that time. Um, and after creating these tests for the Army, he also um, developed standardized intelligence tests that were um, and advocated for their use in public schools. Um, it is also generally protocol to note that they both renounced their affiliation with eugenics in the 30s, um, although Henry Goddard later in the 40s, near the time of his death, um, uh, kind of went back and forth about whether the pressure he felt to, to, um, to uh, go to renounce his affiliation. So. There's more detail written about that in the book, but I'm not gonna go into the detail of that today. Um, what's important to note is during this time of testing on language minoritized individuals is that from the very beginning, people thought that these intelligence tests weren't quite working. So there was something off with using intelligence tests except for, for the, basically for the same, to reify the, the standards and norms that were already there. So if you were a monolingual white middle class male, you usually did well on these tests, right? Um, and so from the beginning, people were seeing that there were issues with the tests. Um, uh, George Sanchez, he was one of the only bilingual psychologists re researching um, in this field at the time, also um, talked about how not using bilingual children to norm the tests or develop a test was highly problematic. But it's important to note that during the time when most testing was being developed in the United States, so post-World War I, um, that's when the most restrictive immigration policies were enacted in the United States. So the number of people that would be considered language minoritized bilingual was extremely, was, was lower in terms of the population. And so there wasn't, um, in terms of the focus and the drive and the need, it just wasn't as present um, as maybe we see um, currently. So that's why even as uh, recently as 1989, Duran had written about these five issues with testing with language minoritized bilinguals that are still present today. Um, so I kind of mentioned these gaps because when it comes to test accommodations, um, they became used first with students with disabilities, with high incidence disabilities um, in 1973. And then it was in 2001 was when they first became part of federal policy. So they were used informally with um, a national assessment of educational progress, the NAEP test in the United States in 96. But this is how recent test accommodations are in terms of a part practice and a policy and a, an item of research for um, language minoritized bilinguals. Um, and then with the passage of the Every Student Succeeds Act in the United States, they became um, required within classroom assessment situations as well. So not just with standardized assessments, but in the classroom. Um, 
So according to the current research that we do have available on this idea of reducing construct irrelevant variance due to language, um, we don't see widespread um, evidence that this is effective. Right? There's sometimes um, small um, areas where you can find some levels of statistical significance comparing accommodated and unaccommodated scores um, based on English language proficiency, instruction, a, a lot of mitigating factors. Um, but by and large, we're not seeing test accommodations as achieving what they're claimed to achieve. Um, in addition, in terms of using them in the classroom within teaching and learning, like there's really almost no um, evidence that that would be an effective um, pedagogical practice. Um, and even people within the assessment field, right? So these are Kiefer and his colleagues that did have done two major meta-analyses on the effectiveness of test accommodations also state that they're not a solution to the larger issues of promoting academic skills, right? So they're not really associated closely with teaching and learning. And so I wanted to show you what comparison of test scores looks like when, you, when um, we're trying to see how students are performing with accommodations and compared to their non-accommodated test peers. And when I show you these data, so this is, I just took this copy and paste from the reports on the National Assessment of Educational Progress, the NAEP scores. Um, so this is their language around how they frame the test results. Um, what I want to just kind of draw your attention to when we look at these is, although they're doing some fine-grained analysis, the two lines are so separate, right? Mm -hmm. The entire time. Mm -hmm. And I, I did not look hard for this information. I Googled, I searched for this. This is the first thing that came up. I found this immediately. Trying to find evidence of a test accommodation or scores coming close together is really a lot more difficult. There's a little bit more data coming out of New York right now with long-term English language learners, ever else, students that have been classified as English language learners for six or more years. But that could be more an issue with classification than, than what we're seeing here. And so I'd like to put that in conversation with the ideas of achievement opportunity gaps. Um, and what I'm trying to figure out how to name, but really it's the reifying oppression gap, right? Like there's no, it's, it's less about achievement for sure, because the tests are just inaccurate for these populations, right? Opportunity, sure, sure, like that, that is reflected in it as well. Um, but it also, without talking about it and the actual consequences that this has, has on students, we're just reifying the oppression that, that they face based on their performance on these tests. So in summary, um, the current, currently tests largely operate as tools or mechanisms of oppressive, oppression in concert with other forces, such as policies, curriculums, court cases, to perpetuate colonial white supremacist eugenic, eugenic structures. They exist as such despite many intentions otherwise because of the lack of concentrated efforts to grapple with the connections between current efforts and the traditions and histories of the field and practice. And furthermore, when innovations such as test accommodations masquerade under the umbrella of equity, they not only contribute to the direct harm with their use, but an indirect harm because they restrict the development of alternative approaches. Right, and that's the, the part that probably like frustrates me the most, right, is, is they've taken up all the space mm -hmm. in equity work. And so trying to put translanguaging in that space is extremely difficult, right, because this is where all the time, money, time and money, yeah. especially the money, all of the grant work is going towards test accommodations. Um, and so in drawing from Angel's work um, about alternative research approaches that I think are important to connect with this um, is really focusing on socially, culturally, historically, institutionally situated perspectives, right? And how is, this connects with um, language learning curriculum, teacher education, right? And all of this combined together. Um, in doing so, we have to move away from um, centering production of disciplinary knowledge and discourse from Anglo-speaking countries and start to pull from other areas of the world. Um, 
And in doing that, really moving away from, especially in assessment, moving away from psychometric measures, which have been the gold standard um, practice, to things that, are, that include narrative discourse, cultural, critical, ethnography, cultural studies, and autobiographical studies. So in doing so, um, I have these questions that I pose for people working in assessment that I think link with this work. Um, so the first is just taking time to think who is being asked to take what tests in which languages, where, when, and how, and what communities do these test takers belong to, and really not just focusing on an individual with a test taker, but the, the effect of, um, of being part of communities and community experiences with testing as well. Um, why are they being asked to take these tests? What are the historical and treat um, experiences and treatments of these communities in relation to who they are and why they're being asked to take tests. The related political, economic, structural, social, discursive histories present and present circulating around test use and the actions being ta taken to address those historical and present experiences. And so we've moved through all of this so now we're moving to actions and how to, how to move forward in life. Um, although I love the critiques a lot, but it's really important also, I think, to understand that I, I work in testing. Like, I, I made tests. I, a lot of my friends are, are very entrenched in the testing system, and so trying to work with them to go into other places is important. Um, and talk more about that later, because I think it's really easy to dismiss testers, right? As just like evil or the enemy. Um, but that's part of human experience, right? Like we still, in order to get some things done, like sometimes you still have to see the humanity in like an evil human being or an evil practice um, in order to move forward. So in, <laughs> to do this, I focus on relations or relationships in work. Um, and so this is I the idea of becoming, of being among, within, between, and a collective of us and having shared commitments. Um, the shared commitments is really important. Um, and that can be shared commitments for dismantling forms of oppression towards translanguaging, towards um, equitable approaches for assessment, whatever those shared commitments are, it's just that's kind of important for the relationship building task. And also understanding that um, Within collaboration and relationship building, you're, you're building a deeper situational awareness that generates many divergent spaces where innovation can contribute positively to the well-being of the whole. So it's, it's a complex um, negotiation that's kind of always a bit of give and take. Um, and I like this idea of generating many divergent spaces, right? So you're not just coming up with a solution. It's not a problem and a solution, right? It's a, a working, finding ways to continue to work together. Okay, so this would be a, a very text-heavy slide. Um, and this, um, this draws from Kim Tallbear's work on um, caretaking relationships and rejecting hierarchies. Um, and this goes beyond the idea of relationships between people collaborating, but really moving beyond um, human, non-human binaries. Um, and hierarchies and understanding what we're privileging. Um, so she pulls from the Dakota understanding of being in good relation mm -hmm. and thinking about it, that in terms of caretaking relations, both human and other than human. And this pushes very actively against settler colonial um, aspirations in terms of education or just in, she, she talks about it in relation to the American dream. But I think what's important and what really connects with education and testing specifically is this idea that, um, that this caretaking relations is a narrative to help us resist the dreams of progress towards a never arriving future of tolerance and good, right? So if we're always going, to, we're always trying to push towards this area of equity with testing that doesn't actually exist with the current tools and um, models that we have available. We're just in this, we're just playing into this mode of, um, of, yeah, yeah, of, uh, yeah, we're just playing into this paradox, right? So 
um, what I think she, she, she terms as hierarchical violence as part of this is really important. Um, me not necessarily having suffered from these forms of testing, but knowing the ways that these testings, these forms of testing have affected a lot of people's lives. Um, the idea of hierarchical of violence, comparing to violence, is not an, a stretch at all. Um, so I'm not talking about it here, um, but I do talk a lot about like the role, the role and relationship between testing and forced sterilization within the eugenics movement, right? And that's something that still continues today. Um, and understanding how these things all come together is, I think, pretty important um, when working in testing. Um, and so with focusing on relationships more than anything, that's kind of how I, I'm moving forward with this work in testing. Um, and a lot of it has to do with this idea of flexibility and responsiveness within relationship building. So that's the idea of it never really being a, a static type of thing. Um, and then we come to translanguaging. Um, and I'll explain why, why it's coming up at this late in the talk too when I show some of the evidence from our research together. So translanguaging, very simply, um, first to language practices of bilingual people, um, uses the ING form to show action of the practice of people bilingually. So it's moving away from this very old model of bilingualism of two monolinguals in one head to a unitary view of um, bilingualism. So I'll show a tiny video clip of just some students being bilingual in a classroom, but I won't show the whole thing. Let's see if it's... Oh, in just a second. So the audio doesn't work. Yeah, through this? Um, you need to play the video on it? Yeah. The audio's not coming through? No. Okay, one second here. Do you need an HDMI? Uh, no, it should. It should played be before. Playing. Yeah, it should play. Okay. No. Is it okay to start again, Angel? Okay. Um, okay, so in terms of other ways of understanding translanguaging, it is associated with the language as a resource orientation um, and theories of language as dynamic, as a dynamic linguistic repertoire, um, reflecting individual and community-based language use. Um, so here's just some examples of benefits of being bilingual. A lot of my examples are gonna be Spanish and English because a lot of my work's being done in Mexico right now. Um, another important aspect of um, translanguaging is that you're working towards sophisticated advanced language learning, however you're deciding to define that. Um, that remains contextually relevant by making the multilingualism of the learner visible and valuable. Um, so you can see actually in here there's um, two different varieties of, of English. There's a non-standard and standard variety and then um, Spanish. So I can kind of go through this one. This, tweet for you so the person writes, I love being bilingual, I'd be at work like, hi, you guys finding everything okay? And they'd be like, nods head. Um, and then I'd be like, and then I'll just translate. So if you have any questions, um, you can ask me like with confidence or I can, you can trust me. And their faces brighten up, they're like, oh yeah, like we, oh, you speak Spanish really well. Um, and so all the different modes of communication that are happening here, also with the emojis, right? Um, um, all kind of fit within this idea of translanguaging and I guess transsemiotizing. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then another aspect of translanguaging which connects with the, what I've been talking about before is this idea that translanguaging um, contributes to a social justice agenda, agenda, right? So it's meant to be a transformative social action. Um, and that's really important 
when we're trying to talk about also the role of Spanish in, in the United States in particular, because it is also the legacy of another colonial language and of colonization of, the, um, of Latin in South America. Um, and so all of these kind of all of these things come together in trying to understand translanguaging as an anti-oppressive act. Um, and so translanguaging, I think, can be used to um, actively combat inequities and can be used to examine the social implications of our work. Um, can view education and translanguaging as a tool to undo decades and centuries of oppression, to actively use it in that way and to understand the complexities of what a transformative practice is. Um, so connecting this to um, Paulo Freire's work um, and Pedagogy of the Oppressed, um, really looking at how education can be used to function right as an instrument used to facilitate integration of younger generations into the logic of the present system, bring about conformity, right? Um, or it becomes a practice of freedom, the means by which men and women deal critically and creatively with the reality and discover how to participate in the transformation of their world, right? And so this, not just the critically, right, but the creativity part has largely been lacking from a lot of assessment work. Um, and so trying to find ways to have that become something that can be transformative is where trying to situate um, these studies. And in order to do this, um, um, so I'm going to transition now into talking about some, some research that I've done. I do some participatory action research and critical ethnography um, and find these to be very well situated for this type of work because they um, ask all parties involved to have some type of collective commitment to the issues being researched. Um, the valuing of self and collective reflection to understand the issues being investigated, working towards consensus building and joint decision making for the benefit of all those being impacted. So really, again, focusing on who's being impacted by the work, on, mm -hmm. impacted by the work. And really making sure that the team does work together in all stages of the work. So in planning, implementation, and dissemination. And in doing so, in connecting this with critical ethnography, that really helps to actively reinscribe traditional power dynamics in interactions between researchers and the researched, um, and doing that by putting together some, uh, a team. And so critical ethnography attends to interactional relationships um, and really also helps to question notions objective, of objective observation and subjective interpretations in terms of how knowledge is created. Um, and within critical ethnography, there's um, uh, Awad Ibrahim's hanging out methodology, which I think should get a lot more attention um, as an authentic way to do work that um, really attends to the way it impacts individuals. So he talked, in his work he was in schools and he was familiarizing himself with the different informal sites where people felt comfortable speaking their minds. Um, so often in our, in our work we're asked to actually have like focus group in a controlled setting, right? Um, and this really pushes against that idea. Um, and connecting relationships with PAR and with critical ethnography, um, in our work, we emphasize genuine care and interdependence amongst each other that can be leveraged to foster learning. And importantly, um, we do this work, we're trying to make situations where we want to work together, where we want to collaborate, where we want the projects to move forward. Um, and in taking in time to nurture the connections, um, really we feel creates much more dynamic understandings of the peoples, the places, ourselves, um, which can really enhance the quality of the work and the learning opportunities for those impacted. So today, we're going to explore three stories from Oaxaca in Mexico. So this is my attempt at trying to make a meme. Um, so we're gonna try to do anti-oppressive approaches. We're not gonna do high standards or growth models or accountability systems. Instead, we're gonna see about how it can, we can use assessments to protest oppression, support indigenous rights, question capitalist motivations, tackle white supremacy and racism. Um, and so in being a US researcher who's working in Mexico, um, largely with 
a team of colleagues from Mexico, although we do have a colleague from London as well. Um, um, it's important to understand the relationship between Mexico and the United States. And so this is from my colleague in Mexico. Um, and just knowing, so in the United States, the discourses around Mexico are um, highly problematic, but the actual impact of, of the relationship between the two countries isn't very well understood um, in terms of day-to-day -day lives because it's so often taken for granted. In Mexico, the relationship between the two countries is felt very immediately. Um, the clearest example was when Donald Trump was elected, the um, currency, the peso, um, dropped in its value in relation to the US dollar significantly. Um, and so things like this are kind of kind of constantly happening in terms of what happens in the United States can dramatically affect Mexico kind of immediately. Um, and so discourses of the United States are always part of what's going on in our work there. Because we are focusing on language, I think it's important to understand Mexico um, in relation to other countries in the world in terms of the linguistic diversity of the area. Um, so here it's listed as the fifth most linguistically diverse country in the world. Um, here you know there are always the issues with how to count languages, but this is like a pretty good representation of trying to understand how um, the linguistic diversity of Mexico is, is often not understood. And a lot of the reasons why it's not very well understood is that um, the linguistic diversity is mostly um, centralized in southern Mexico than in the poorest states in Mexico. So Oaxaca, you can see here. Um, so that's where um, all of our work is taking place. Um, has, um, I think, eight different language families, um, over 100 different varieties of indigenous languages there, in addition to Spanish, English, and other world languages. Um, and Oaxaca isn't just about language, right? So it's also about the people, the land, the beautiful colonial architecture of Santo Domingo's church. Um, and they, there's still these influences, right? So Catholicism is still a um, very important part of what's uh, of Oaxacan life day to day, but it, this is just to give you an idea of some of the way things look there. And in terms of presenting without my collaborative team, it's always a little bit odd for me, so I bring them with me in pictures. <laughs> these are some of the different places we've done work together. Um, and then usually when we work together, sometimes we take breaks mm -hmm. and we enjoy life together too, which um, occasionally I'm hesitant to show these, but I think it's actually really important mm -hmm. in terms of, again, the, the work is better because we want to work together and we want to spend time together. Mm -hmm. okay. So for the three stories, um, the first one is going to focus on teacher education. Um, and using multilingual approaches in an assessment course. So this is actually how it all started. Like I came down to Oaxaca and I um, did some workshops and co-taught a class with my colleague Mario Lopez Gopar um, um, for, our master's, for their master's program. It was their master's program on critical language education and their first cohort of students that they'd had in that program. Um, we met Fridays and Saturdays for four hours each day for three weeks. So I attended all of those classes and we co-taught those classes. And in, it was a class called Translanguaging and Assessment. Um, and the teachers' views, views really were across the spectrum. So they viewed multilingualism as optional for assessments, um, as a scaffold, and sometimes integral to test design and scoring. So I wanted to show you the ways that we tried to have them create tests to plan for translanguaging. So we did a um, kind of an adaptation between the PSYOP model, which talks about language and content objectives, and what you probably have seen in um, your research classes or when you do your own research too, where you set up the like, what are your research questions with the evidence you need and the method to, to gather the evidence. Um, so we put all of that together to kind of build off of some things that the students already knew um, and to also create something that was kind of easy for us to kind of make sense of across different assessments that the students were creating. So this was an example one that we gave to the students. So one 
students that they had their students, they always have their students write autobiographies. So we wanted to figure out how we, could we write um, objectives for an autobiography that would include multilingualism or translanguaging. Um, and I'm using those words interchangeably. I'm, I mean pretty much the same thing when I say them. Um, and so first we came up with this content objective, which was very broad. The language objective was very specific. Um, and so these IEs were things that needed to be specifically included as part of the student's um, writing. Um, and one part of it that I've highlighted here is that we needed evidence of multilingualism. And in the method to guide it, yeah. So let's see. So this translated then into this type of rubric. So then we had to decide how to weight each section. So we had a lot of debates about this too. So approximating standard American English, um, written in standard American English, um, the percentages we came up were a hotly negotiated topic in the class. Um, and you can see they only had to do three of these multiple characteristics. Um, they needed narrative structure and they also needed, um, we gave, um, weight to multilingualism in this example. And so what that meant was when a student wrote an essay like this, it, mean, it didn't have to sound exactly like standard American English, right? It could have elements that made sense because the student was bilingual, the student didn't know Spanish, and that was valued in this. And actually it was expected. Um, So you can see like here, time passed and left kinder, right? So like forgetting the, we're not including the pronoun in English where it's very common in Spanish to, to not need the pronoun. Um, again, not everyone agreed with this in, in the class and I'll talk about that kind of at the end because the same tensions that came up in this project have continually come up in all of our projects there. Um, but I'll move on to what, how this, class became a different study. Um, and so in our second story, we are comparing performance on multilingual and monolingual writing tasks. So by multilingual, I mean that there are readings in two different languages and the writing is still just in English. And monolingual, everything is in English. Um, and how this study came about was we needed, there was a call for um, empirical data to support translanguaging and assessments, especially because we were trying to find a way to use assessments in classes that would be translanguaging assessments that we would use for students' grades. Um, and so the idea of just experimenting or piloting when students had their grades depended on that and all of the consequences that that entailed, um, uh, nobody was on board with that. The administration was not on board, the teachers were not on board, and for sure the students were not super happy about that idea. Um, and so first we did this um, very kind of traditional quasi-experimental comparison study. Um, we co-designed the assessments that we used for the study with the classroom teacher. Um, and they were done with attention to the objectives for different course syllabi. Um, the researchers were um, positioned often as assistants to the teacher, so we were really kind of helping him out and, and doing these things for him in responsive to what he thought was important. Um, as such, um, there was an exclusion of the indigenous languages that were common in the classroom um, and a focus on English and Spanish. Um, that was really the express needs of the teachers and the administrators. And so in our, in our um, findings of, uh, from that study, uh, we felt that we did find empirical evidence, some empirical evidence um, that this assessment approach did support the idea of using students' full linguistic repertoire. Um, because the, the people who took the test, they're pre-service English teachers. Um, so all university students um, performed better on the multilingual test than a monolingual English task at a level of statistical significance. Um, and not only that, but we had one of the criteria on the um, rubric that was focused on higher order thinking skills. And that was actually the the area where they performed better at the level of st statistical significance. So that was really the deciding factor. They were able to be, they were able to write more complex 
answers in English when they had materials in both languages than writing in English when they only had materials in English. Okay. So from that, then we felt comfortable doing a PAR work together and working at, in um, Julio's classroom. And at first we actually were only gonna work for one semester, but it was going so well, we extended it for an entire academic year. Or we were, we were still having more questions, I guess not going so well, but we had a lot more questions that we wanted to answer. Um, um, and when we were doing this study as well, in terms of the collaborative approach, we wanted to see how the students were feeling. And so in order to feel okay moving forward with the students as well, so not just with the teachers and administrators, we asked them some of their initial um, opinions about how they felt about the mix, use of Spanish and English in the classroom. So we asked them how they felt if the teacher used the Spanish to teach English, and they felt um, secure, safe. Like, yeah, then I can understand. Um, and also, when he speaks in English, like, I pay more attention. Or when he speaks in Spanish, I pay more attention. But then we asked them what they would think about using Spanish on a test for English, and they said, what? Like, what? we're supposed to be learning Spanish, or supposed to be learning English. Why would we have the test in Spanish? So there was, the, the students, just like the teachers, just like the administrators, they, we all live in the same world, right? Where everything seemed fine up until it was on the test, right? That it just didn't make sense to have the multilingual test in these language classrooms. So then we created a test just to see, like, what would happen. And we didn't solicit multilingual responses. We just documented what they were doing. And they used Spanish in their writing of English. Um, and so here we see just the use of pronouns. Um, and the use of uh, an abbreviation, so that's um, millions of pesos. Um, and then also in just writing the word Mexico with the accent so that it would be Mexico and not Mexico. And even students showing really explicitly, they know they're writing it in Spanish. So we talked with um, Sergio about this and he said, oh, I was gonna go back and ask the teacher later but I forgot, he's like, but I, he's like, I was just writing, trying to get my idea across, so I just wanted to keep writing. So he used Spanish to continue to, to have meaning. And the same thing was with the student, um, Amelia. So she, um, we, so in government, you see her using the B, so that's like a little bit, just a one letter borrowing from Spanish. Um, and even her spellings are not like exactly the spellings from Spanish. Um, or she has here um, kind of a mix of Spanish and English um, with morphemes. Um, but she also, when we talked with her about it, so we did, um, what was it like, um, member checks, or we, we did interviews with them afterwards, and they said, oh yeah, they were just trying to finish the test. I had a lot I wanted to say about the topic. So that was the other thing about this is, if you notice from the content of what they're writing, there had been an earthquake um, in Oaxaca um, right before we decided to continue this study. Um, so long story short, we had planned to just do another um, quasi-experimental study, um, but when I arrived in Oaxaca, it was three weeks after a massive earthquake. And so the idea of doing something that looked so much like traditional research and wasn't actually um, responsive to what the students were thinking about and, and talking about every day didn't make sense. And so we decided to make sure that the tests were also reflective of what they wanted to talk about, the topics they, want, they wanted to focus on. Um, and the earthquakes was one of, the, one of those, and also the issues with the corruption with the funding um, post-earthquake. And so in all of this, we think that these findings and from these and the previous studies, um, really helped us to continue to, to continue our work. We kept checking in with the students, we keep working with the teachers, um, and yeah, based on what we were able to do with one, we can keep moving forward, right? Um, yeah. And so that brings me back to the, the beginning question. Um, so, in terms of how can translanguaging re resist and dismantle colonialism in schools and testing, 
Um, I think the most important thing is just this forming this deeper understanding. So you notice the focus is a lot less on translanguaging and more on, on working together and fo working on working with each other. And this is a bit um, nihilistic or fatalist of me to put here, but really this idea of how to succeed in testing and then you die anyway, right? Um, no matter what, like how we really want to make sure that people are doing well in life in general and this idea of this whole, this more holistic humanistic perspective um, rather than just improving achievement on a test. The second way is continuing to have this active engagement with attentions around supporting translanguaging within institutions and societies that value monolingual proficiency norms. Um, and doing it in a way where you're also actively addressing colonial white supremacist oppressive systems and actions. Um, 